Hey everybody, welcome to the show. I am Hody Johns. I'm Aaron V. And I'm Chris Galt. And this is Enemy of My Enemy. We're trying a pilot episode right now. If we get a lot of positive fan interaction, we will keep up this show. If not, then we're going to have fun for one episode. And I'm I'm very grateful for that. So <laughs> this is the We're Libertarians Network, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, this is kind of a left-right center. I am representing the center. Aaron's going to represent the left libertarians. And Chris, is go Chris Galt is going to represent the uh, right libertarians. And uh, we're just looking for a discussion as well as debate. So... Uh, everybody can know what that sounds like. So that's what we're all about. We're going to jump right in with our first, our, our pilot topic, which, uh, which is the impeachment of Donald Trump and should he have been impeached and kind of our thoughts about that whole, about that whole thing. Uh, so on January 6th, uh, Donald Trump, as well as some friends and family, got up to talk about how the election was stolen, made a few speeches, kind of had a rally together. It was official. It was. It wasn't spur of the moment. They all got together. We're like, hey, let's let's talk. They said their piece. After they said their piece, uh, these same, much these same people who were at this protest. In fact, if you listen to the We're Libertarians regular episodes, you'll actually hear a couple people who were at the protest and then went over to kind of become around slash become part of the riot um, where they invade the Capitol building. There was one uh, police officer who was murdered as well as uh, four rioters uh, died as a result. And Trump was then, uh, in, he was impeached again. Impeachment doesn't necessarily mean you're kicked out of office. He was impeached again. And, uh, but they did not vote to, uh, to kick him out of office. Obviously he wasn't president at the time this vote came around, but he can no longer hold office if if they were to have impeached, uh, I guess gone through with the motion. It did not succeed. There were, I believe 10 Republicans that joined with a unified uh, democratic front to, um, uh, to impeach him. So he can uh, still run for office in 2024 for better or for worse. Um, so, uh, what do you think? I'm going to start with Aaron. What do you think about the impeachment? What are some of your thoughts? Uh, so where where it all falls for me, I, I clearly clearly he was guilty of spreading disinformation. Clearly, there was several instances that you could point to that are fairly obvious that he was pointing his supporters in a way towards hatred, towards violence, towards that kind of, that kind of thought process. Um, I, I think really like the, where it comes down to is what are the limitations on your free speech? What are the limitations of the first amendment? And like, we have plenty of laws that, that, you can point to, for example, you, uh, Rudy Giuliani is being sued by uh, the company that runs the, the voting machines for libel because he lied and potentially cost them a lot of money. And I, I think it's much the same thing that we're seeing from Donald Trump and the, the rest of the Republicans on that side. And for, for people like Ted Cruz, and there were other examples to say that they already know how they're going to vote before they've seen any of the information, before they've even sat down for a juror to say they already know how they're going to vote before they've seen any information on the trial, I think is inexcusable. I think it's disgusting. And that's not how the country is supposed to run. Uh, all right, uh, Chris, what, what are some of your thoughts on impeachment? Um, yeah, I, I can I can see that as being the ba pretty much the main basis for it would be the limitations on freedom of speech. Obviously, the limitations on freedom of speech would be uh, when 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 harm's being done. Um, when it results in violence and and it's very easy to argue that the events of the Capitol did result in violence and it started with freedom of speech um, or someone's speech that started those violent acts so 
Um, although I do think that the events, um, the media did did um, uh, blow them a little out of proportion. I do think that there was violence that led to that. So um, the first impeachment, political sham. The second impeachment, because of that violent act, I mean, because of the result of what happened, I mean, yeah, it was uh, impeachable. Um, I actually think we should impeach more people. I think that politicians all of the time do things that um, – that it doesn't even have to be freedom of speech, things that are against the interests of the people. And, and I think that Congress should impeach more the presidents more often and other officials more often. I think it should be used a lot more. And then the Senate's still there as a check to make sure they're not removed from office for a political move to impeach someone, right? That's why he wasn't removed the first time. So um, that's what I think. I think we need more impeachment. Um, I, don't, I don't think any of them work for our interests, so let's impeach them all. <laughs> what do you think, Cody? So my thoughts probably would have been almost exactly the opposite of yours. I probably would not have impeached him for inciting a riot and would have impeached him the first time uh, wow. for, I mean, just not complete non-cooperation with that investigation. Um, I, I, for me, I think here's what it is. Inciting a riot is reprehensible, but I would rather see a social consequence rather than a legal consequence or um, because I think the problem with inciting a riot, first of all, the standard is actually crazy high. Um, the Supreme Court, everything fell under the First Amendment. It was challenged when all the way to Supreme Court in 1969 in a case called uh, Brandenburg versus Ohio. And it was a KKK guy who said some awful things. And uh, <laughs> I know this is a surprise that the KKK would say awful things, but you know, said some awful things. Some people acted in turn, and they established um, a policy. They they established that no, he can't be tried for inciting a riot. He actually has to specifically tell somebody to do violence um, and plan on the violence. And so that actually has been challenged twice in the Supreme Court since then. Both the times the Brandenburg decision has been upheld. Now, an impeachment is not a legal process. I'm sure somebody out there is screaming at right, me that's right what now. I was, yeah. Right. It's not a legal process. Basically, you can say like for pretty much being a jerk or for pretty mm -hmm. much inciting a riot, right? But but I think for me, it, it is kind of a technical thing. I, I think for me, I would have impeached Donald Trump for maybe like a thousand different things. I don't like the precedent of saying what's the limit of free speech. I, I, I do agree that there is some amount of culpability when you say like, hey, go kill somebody and they kill somebody. Otherwise, like what? Hitler is completely innocent, right? <laughs> like, because, hey, you just told other people to kill people. He's not doing it himself. Obviously, there is some kind of, kind of limit there. But as far as spreading, you know, should you be able to lie? Well, I, I, I'm having trouble thinking of any media organization that would exist without being able to lie. And I'm not even saying... I'm not trying to be like, oh, every media lies and oh, they're all full of lies. But I mean, on some occasion, they picked up a story that wasn't true. Yep. You know what I mean? And and been like, okay, so what? And we caught, we hurt this person. Do we have to go out of business? Or we lose millions of dollars? Is this, you know, what should be the punishment there? Um, there was one specific point. I think if you were to charge anybody with inciting a riot, there was one point that Donald Trump Jr. was talking specifically about the BLM and the violence there, and then actually said, and this is Donald Trump Jr., but said, we need to fight like they do right after talking about that violence. And kind of it's like, okay. And that's when you started to hear the chants turn into like, let's kill Mike Pence. And, and it was like, all right, you probably should have gathered that this was turning into a violent event, you know? And, and at some point you do need to use a little common sense and you can't be like, well, we told them to be peaceful. We you didn't, you told, you actually specifically told them we got to start fighting like the Democrats do. That is a quote when in reference to like the BLM rioting and I'm not, I'm aware not all the BLM was riots. I think a lot of people like to boil it down to that, no. but that it, it was, it, it, he had just made the inference about the violent parts of that and then said, we got to fight like that too. And that's when I kind of went, Oh, I think that's what maybe why they got so angry and where they got the idea from. But I mean, th those are my two cents on it. Uh, I think it was terrible. I think it was reprehensible. Obviously, anytime you're spreading lies and if that those lies result in violence, even if I don't think you should be impeached, still not good. 
Absolutely. I, uh, I, the, the, the second impeachment for me, I mean, they didn't really, it didn't, he was already out of office. So, I mean, the, the first impeachment, however, that's why that's, tell me a little bit more about, about what, what you were saying about that, <laughs> that you were, uh, that he was, um, what did you say? Blocking, getting in the way of the investigation? Yeah, like straight up telling people not to cooperate. And I think for me, this is not how, like for me as a libertarian that wants transparency, because I think that established for me, I can't imagine Joe Biden doing something now that's awful that we'd be able to convict him on. Just because it's as simple as just being like, oh, hey, not today. So, um there was a report about like when Tom Brady did the deflate gate thing mm -hmm. and they never were able to find it out from him, but they found all the text messages and then they, like he destroyed his cell phone, like right in front of him. And they're like, Oh, Hey Tom, you met with me. And he's like, Oh, <laughs> later guys, I'll meet with you. And at some point you're kind of like, okay, like this is, this is getting to the point where it's like a normal person doesn't throw their cell phone in a fireplace, you know, and no, you kind of, well, you say, don't like, expect him to self incriminate himself. If he knows there's evidence on there that convicts him, do you? Right, well, you know, I mean, and, and, and you don't expect that from Tom Brady or the president, do you? There's a difference between <laughs> not incriminating yourself and hindering an investigation. Correct, and this, this for me, that's a great point. And this for me fell into like the hindering an investigation. As a libertarian, I think anything that opens the doors to just say like, "Hey, come on in." videotapes everywhere make every politician wear a gopro at all times yeah. you know like i mean that's just and so as soon as you're like oh i got rid of those so, documents or i told that person not to yeah. talk to that person maybe you legally can but you're not being cool and <laughs> like we talked about with impeachment is was it cool no it really wasn't you know and like for me when you're hindering the investigation like that get them out of there i will say i not, not to completely count your point chris like we should impeach more politicians. Like <laughs> if the standard is just not liking them, I'm okay with establishing that precedent. You know, I wouldn't be broken hearted even if Trump were convicted the second, you know, convicted the second time, because then they say, well, what now, now pretty much we convict every president we don't like. And I'm like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Impeach yeah. every president. <laughs> as, soon, as soon as they're being fishy. And then that way the Senate votes on it. We can remove them all. Like let's right. replace them. <laughs> yeah. let's, I mean, obviously going down the, going down the leadership ladder isn't always a great thing, but it is. I mean, then you're talking about smaller terms for each president. <laughs> Because you can split that one term up into three different presidents. Let's do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's our dream. That's the dream, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> With the impeachments. <laughs> right. I, held, I hate to celebrate getting Trump out of office and putting Pence in there. But then, like you said, hopefully that it would be only a matter of time yeah. before we cycled all the way through. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think this is probably the natural libertarian standpoint is we want it to be so if uh, if the office must exist, mm -hmm. that you have to be so pure that nobody aside from like a total saint would even think about running for office. You know, and, if you're going to hold the highest office in the land, there should be a there should be a crazy high amount of, count of, of accountability. You can't. You can't be on a nuclear submarine without passing crazy amounts of tests and you are held to the highest standard in the land, period. And I don't think you should have the button for the nuclear weapons without being held to a higher standard than the rest of the country. And I think that's kind of what the impeachment is about. It wasn't about putting the man in jail because the, the, the criminal lawsuits have already been like the, the precedent's already there. For that that wasn't that wasn't the idea right it was what he did was was against the country's interests and what he did was hurt the people and we can't we can't let presidents do that hmm. so where, where, let me ask you then turn it back at you aaron where do you then draw the line because uh, like d what is your line i guess because for me when we say and as libertarians, we kind of all believe in the NAP, right? The non-aggression principle. You don't hurt, hurt anybody, you know, unless it's defensive violence or whatever. You don't, you don't hurt anybody. It's not hurting you, right? But like we're talking about words. You can hurt somebody with your words. Well, then all of a sudden, if I call somebody an idiot and they go kill themselves, have I violated the NAP? Well, I, I think that... I think that where, where you draw the line is... Like uh, right along the lines of the non-aggression principle is is have I 
have I hurt you physically? Have I stolen from you or have I defraud you? And I think that's part of where lying comes in is I'm defrauding you of your money because I'm leading others to believe a certain circumstance that's not the case and it's costing you your money. So I, uh, it's, it's hard for me to say that we should, that we should litigate woke culture. Like it, I, you can't make it law that you can't say this word or that word because it hurts someone's feelings. I do agree with it being law that you can't say those words and then beat them to death because then that becomes a hate crime. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you're beating somebody to death, I mean, whether you call it a hate crime or not, that's already right. pretty or, bad, right? <laughs> or, or, you know, or, you know, it doesn't have to be murder is murder. It, it could be defrauding them and you've slandered this man's name. Sure. And, and you're talking about his personal life. Like, is that a hate crime? Yeah, slander is hard. It, it is. It's it's just because I think the thing is you can, I mean, theoretically, I have said some bad things about certain news outlets and they could be like, that's slander, sir. You've cost us 15 listeners that listen. To the, <laughs> that stop listening because of you. You know what I mean? It's like, right. and that's hard. I mean, and, and not that I go, not, not that I try to make a habit going about lying about, you know, media outlets or news organizations, but I think this does boil down to the individual. And that's why I think it's a hard, it's hard for me to draw a line. I don't necessarily have the answer, which is probably why right, I asked you, you instead of myself, but. Right, which is why I would say that I don't argue for litigating woke culture. Yeah. I don't think that's the right answer. Like, sure. as, as Chris would say, the, you know, the antidote for bad speech isn't censorship, it's more speech. <laughs> You're gonna say my lines for me? <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna turn to you, Chris, but Aaron because, already got because it. we we live in a marketplace of ideas, and that's why we we shouldn't be afraid of lies and bad ideas because because we live we have more information now than we've ever had in history. Right now, at our fingertips on the internet, you can find out if something's true or not just by researching it. And if you can't, well, then you only get to make an informed decision on what your opinion of that is. And based off the facts that you have, and that's a beautiful thing, and and that's why I don't believe in any any sort of regulation of free speech because it, even if it's uh, even if it's uh, a lie, even if it's defrauding you, it, it's a mistake you make and it's a choice you make to do it. No, no one that can defraud you can force you to make a decision. You made the decision, and and and. Because you made that bad decision, you will go spread that information that to other people. So then they don't make that same decision. And that marketplace of ideas, that idea will flood into the marketplace and be absorbed by other people. So they don't do the same thing you did. And it'll naturally defeat the enemy. Would you say then that it should not be illegal to hire a hitman? It should not be illegal to hire a hitman. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean that, no, I would say that should be illegal. Okay. But, but I, mean, uh, I mean, let's say I just, I just had a phone conversation. It was their decision to kill somebody. I just <laughs> asked them to do it. Well, that's fair enough. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's a pretty good point. <laughs> I just, it's not, but I just but no, everybody no, that you're, murder. I mean, you're, you're, you're a complicit in the murder. So if, if the murder happens, then you're, you're still guilty. If the murder doesn't happen, I guess not. But so, uh, okay. So it sounds like we're developing a standard here then. So the standard is probably to you that if, if a bad thing happens because of what you said, then it's not protected. Whereas if a right. bad thing, if nothing and bad that, happens. Right. And that's what I said about that the second impeachment it, that that's where nothing he did at the speech or anything that happened was really that bad. And nothing crossed the line for me. And what he said, it was the result of what he said that led to violence. It might not be him that did it, but what he said led to someone else that then 
that then did it. So that's where I could see a, a line crossed there. And but that's where I also said it was uh, it was after he already left office, and you're not going to be able to throw him out of office anyway. You're, so what you're you're you if you wanted him impeached the first time, you would have wanted him thrown out of office then, and then kept from running again, right? So um, because of the intrusion in the election or in the investigation. So um, I'm, I'm assuming you wanted the same thing for Hillary Clinton when she destroyed the, when she destroyed all her servers um, that you would, you didn't, you wanted her barred from running for office ever again. Aaron's nodding his head for those, <laughs> for wow. those not on video. Okay. Yes. Yes, wow. ab absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Cause I knew you agreed with him. Aaron, you, so I didn't you, expect you to say that. Yeah. If you hurt the American people knowingly, and hinder the investigation. Yeah. You should well, because see, my, my argument earlier was that she shouldn't, I mean, they, you shouldn't expect them to self incriminate. So the evidence there, so you're still saying that she should not be allowed to run for office. Interesting. Yes. She should not, she should not be allowed to run for office. She should have, like, if, if, if that's the standard we're going to hold, then yeah, absolutely. If you if you hinder an investigation knowingly, you know you did something wrong. There's a difference between keeping your mouth shut and hiding things. I think those are those are two completely different things. Like if you are actively seeking to obfus obfuscate the truth, that's not the same thing as just keeping your mouth shut. Is it is it when a police officer is at your door? Is that the same principle there? You're not hiding something illegal behind the door that you keep your mouth shut about. Would that not be? Would that not break that same rule? I same think you're like combining the two things I said. Gotcha. <laughs> like I mean, I'm all for keeping your mouth shut, I guess, when the, <laughs> I guess I'm, I see what you're saying. Cause you're saying like, we should have the right to hide things. Yeah, the, the police right, don't right. deserve okay. to know about. Yeah, right. So by, by your and destroy it, and we should be able to destroy it, <laughs> flush it down the toilet, right? Like right. you know, like <laughs> that. I not necessarily agree with. I I agree. I you should you should have the right to not talk to the cop. You should have the right to not answer your door. But I don't think you once you're caught. I don't think you should be able to go and destroy with all the evidence gotcha. of what you did. Well, you I think, knew you were wrong and you knew you were breaking the law. And I think part of it is the position that they're in as well. Like, like for me specifically, and I think we've all at some point indicated when you're in a position of yeah. authority, things change when you say I can control a lot of people's lives. You know, when I have the legal ability to send, I mean, we've had presidents that threw journalists in jail. We've, you know what I mean? That, that, mm -hmm. that they didn't like. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, at the point, I mean, we established gosh, in the last decade that you can, as long as you don't call it war and you call it kinetic military action, you can blow up a, you can blow up a couple hundred thousand people, you know, and, and, and be, and have your hands washed of it and not have, not have to say anything. Obviously that gives you a level of danger. So, you know, there, it stands to reason that if somebody, especially if they've monopolized that force, because I'm not allowed to do that with a drone, you know, then there is a special privilege that they have, which needs a special, I think, kind of responsibility or consequence. You know, I think that's probably why we have things like impeachment, whereas like you can't impeach your, you know, the manager from Denny's for giving you bad service, you know, but we can impeach, you know, the president for lying. They, re for they the represent future. people. They're elected, right. you know. Right. Exactly. Right. Certain amount of damage and power, I think. Um, I, 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 is there a double standard? Let, let's open up this can of worms because I think this will be fun. Do you think there is a double standard between Republicans and Democrats in regards to impeachment? Aaron, you can go first. <laughs> yes. I, yeah. I believe so. Yeah, I, I do believe so. I mean, when when Bill Clinton was being impeached, he was being impeached over a private sexual act and abuse of power that came along with that, right? And I don't remember, I was pretty young then, but I don't remember too many of the Democrats fighting too hard going into it saying, nah, he's innocent. 
we don't need to see any of the evidence. He's innocent. That's how the vote's going to go because they <laughs> the vote to pull it that way. So I see what you're saying. And, that's the way it went this time. <laughs> right. The Republicans didn't need to see any evidence on the trial they're about to be a juror on, and they've already made up their minds. And so I see the left leaning across the aisle when something goes wrong and holding their people accountable, but I don't see the right doing the same thing. All right, Chris, what do you think? Well, I think if there was any difference, there ain't going to be any more here going forward. It's going to be a lot different. And I hope that we impeach every single president from here on out, at least hold the vote and see what happens. You know, like why not? Cause you, you, you don't have to present any evidence now. You don't have to have any kind of formal thing. It's just a, it's whatever the speaker wants to do. So um, if the speaker wants to hold the vote, let's hold it. And I, uh, I support impeaching more, more officials. <laughs> Now, as far as the Clinton thing goes, I definitely was for that impeachment. Now, very specifically, did he lie under oath? Now, not just be saying if you tell a lie when you're president, your presidential oath. Did you lie under oath? He absolutely lied. He, it was literally a sworn testimony he was giving. And he was like, no, nah, I've never seen her, never met her. You know what I mean? And it's funny. It actually wasn't. Be, it, it was related to, you know, of course, the, the Watergate, uh, not Watergate. His other scandal. Uh, I'm an idiot. The first one. The, the one where he uh, laundered money through the, the apartments or whatever. Anyway, I don't know why I can't think of this. Uh, I will look that up on the next time one of you guys are talking. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was related to that. They had this kind of sworn testimony because part of the money was going to pay off women that he had um, wanted to not speak up about it. And uh, this came, the name came up. They weren't trying to get him. And then it came up later. They found this, you know, this oath. And they're like, oh, he did lie under oath. And said he didn't know somebody that he was being with. So the problem is, is that he, I, I think for me, I could see a bit of a double standard with the Republicans and Democrats, but I might see it the opposite way a little bit because inciting a riot by the legal definition, he might, he probably did not do like if it went to court, yeah, Trump no did way. not incite a riot. Right. Whereas if it went to court, Clinton absolutely lied under oath. Like that is, a hundred percent what he did. So when we say no now, I, and I get what you're saying, and like, I, I agree that like, you should, you should see evidence, right? You should hear what it is. On the other hand, I think whereas, and the Kenneth Starr investigation was nutty. I mean, it, it, it got to the point where he's like paying off people and trying to, it's funny because like all he needed to do was present click. Here's the one video of him lying under oath, unclick it's done. You know what? <laughs> Point. He's about to knock over your your poster. Oh, the cat! Oh, it sure oh. is. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, it's cats going here. <laughs> um, the you know, for me, I I think that you should have to see the evidence. However, I do think the evidence that was being presented was a lot of victim stories about what happened to people at the Capitol. Like those were the witnesses. Whereas I think when you're inciting a riot it's not necessarily about the damage it's if you incited a riot, you know? And so for me, I think it would have meant a lot more to me if the, I think I, it, I would have felt a little like it was a less hypocritical if the witnesses that they called forward, because Kenneth Starr at least called witnesses that had to do with the investigation, right? He told his, sec Clinton told his secretary to lie when the investigators asked, you know, Monica Lewinsky was a, a pretty predominant role in that, right? When you call her forward, these are witnesses that are actually core to your investigation. Whereas these, I think this was meant to create, and I'm not, I'm not trying to diminish the sob story, but it, it was, these witnesses were more to make you emotional and say like, boy, the nature of these riots was really bad as opposed to did Donald Trump incite a riot. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I, I, I will agree that there were several of the witnesses that that was their, that was their role was to to create that sob story and show the get get the people on their side we almost died we almost yeah. died. we have to do something about this i hate to call it a sob died. story because yeah they almost died yeah, I we mean, almost was... died like, right so, <laughs> but but I, I was there were for sure at least a few that made at least half decent arguments in my opinion uh going through you know one tweet at a time 
and just just bringing up the facts he said this on this date and this on this date and this on this date and it's not just what he said in this one speech this has been a trend from the day he announced that he was running for president telling people in the crowd oh get that guy out of here you punch that guy in the face i'll pay your legal fees that's <laughs> that's hiring a hitman, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, that is by definition inciting violence. <laughs> like, no, I mean, nobody did it, right? So like, so no, like no. by our standard, I guess he's okay ish. But I mean, it is a messed up thing to say. I don't I don't think uh I, I think when you open up Donald Trump's Twitter, I, so there's this uh, organization that keeps tra uh, track of all the lies that uh, presidents have said. And I remember because I used them a lot, I, I kind of drifted from Republican to left to kind of back to center. But, you know, back when they were really ha hawking what Obama was saying, they're like, oh, we this is unprecedented. He's told four times as many lies as any other president in American history. It's absolutely absurd. And Donald Trump in like two years had eclipsed what Obama had took. Took him eight years to lie, about, you know, on Twitter alone. Like you could just be like, at some point they're like, I don't know if we can even count this. Like it's just a flip book. Like we're just... <laughs> this is a very thick, thick, thick amount of like, you know, uh, disinformation that you're spreading here. And unfortunately, I think we see the effects with, you know, I, 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 we can probably back off with impeachment, but just talk about the effects of these lies for a second. I mean, you look at groups like QAnon and just how detached from reality they were because they assumed that what they saw on Donald Trump's Twitter and these people's Twitter was reality. And it's, You've detached. got senators talking about Jewish space lasers now. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> like, what is that? <laughs> Where does it end? <laughs> right. <sighs> it does so I, I agree it that, that we should have free speech, but that's that's part of what comes along with it is you get you get the crazies that I don't know how in the world they get power. Like, how does someone that really believes that get to the point that they're governing people? Because because the uh, he was anti-establishment, so the power structure he was going against hadn't listened to their own people for decades, and the people were fed up with it, and they were willing to accept a new power structure, even if that meant deal, making a deal with the devil, <laughs> as some would say, um, right. because it was better than what we had been stuck in. <laughs> At least that's the idea, and I think that's why that's the sentiment that was the turning point that elected Trump. I got you. Yeah, I, I was mostly specifically talking about how I, I, know. <laughs> I can't remember that lady's name. She's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Uh, what Marjorie Taylor Greene? Yes, that's the one. Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to at least remember something. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, the um, you know, I, I it is it is surprising uh, to me that I, I, I think for me here's the thing when they talk about like how do these people get elected, first of all, try to get elected is something that is not Republican or Democrat, and you'll probably see why these people get elected. I mean, it, there is no if you've ever worked on a campaign, I'm not even saying libertarian campaign, make an independent run at it, you know, make a Green Party run at it. It is awful. I mean, I can tell you from having been a campaign volunteer for a long time, if you put a candidate up, I mean, they, they have judges that will approve all their signatures without ever collecting their signatures. I mean, technically, they need X amount of signatures to be on the ballot in some state. And they just and they just they have a judge. that will say, I'm not even going to check. If you have them and you have three times the amount of signatures, they're going to call every single phone number that you've collected. They're going to look at every single address that you have down. If the person has moved, even if they still moved in the, inside of the same state, they're going to throw out your signatures. Check I mean, it, duplicates. <laughs> yeah, it's a ridiculous thing. I mean, I, I, so I actually worked for the Republican Party uh, for a little bit. I volunteered, I guess I should say. And we had, I remember fighting with the RNC because we had these Tea Party candidates and they wanted their establishment candidates. And they started doing the same thing to, to the, they were even Republicans, but you know, they were counter to the current Republican party. And the RNC would just squish them down. You know, I think, um, and here, let me put myself back in the center. The DNC even said like a little while ago, like what, well, we'd rather lose with Biden than win with Bernie or something like that. And it's like, oh, well, there they are, folks. <laughs> you know, uh, that, that just proves that they're the same thing. 
<laughs> right. Right. Yeah. They're, they're private party functions. You can't blame them if they're rigged and um, <laughs> they're going to pit up whoever they want. And, and people need to learn that and a re- true people's candidate will never win in either of those parties. Yeah. I mean, it's controversial if they can even win in the political climate that we have at all. I mean, it's just, it, it's when, when you look at how serious they take when a libertarian becomes serious and that's all of a sudden when they turn on the machine, you know, and they're like, all right, well, you know, even if, if they've managed to pass the signature, then it's going to be something else. Um, uh, It's, it's funny. We're talking about this, our premier Ruff, uh, uh, Kim Ruff um, was running for Arizona state mining inspector, gathered a ton of steam, looked to be like a head in the polls was starting to outpace even like the, the Republicans and Democrats as far as money and the GOP, you know, governor signs a thing saying, Nope. Uh, uh, you need to have, uh, four to eight years of experience working under, uh, in this political climate for you to be able to run. I mean, it's just, they'll, they'll, they'll do it as soon as you become a serious threat. And it's, uh, it's heartbreaking. If anything, it, it, at least I'm glad she still did it because at least we have this example to say like, look, this is what we're dealing with. You know, it's not, you know, cause it's easy to just say like, Oh, what well, you can't get the signatures. You're not popular enough. Maybe you should try to be more likable. Well, when we finally put somebody up who is more likable, squish back down, you know, additional rules against us, make it harder to run candidates. Uh, don't even even add, they don't even add a single extra reward for doing any of those things either. It's the exact status quo with more rules. It's not, hey, here's some more rules, but here's additional status and here's additional. You can have primaries now or something, you know, like give us throw us a bone. There's no there's no reward at all. They just raise the difficulty level. They said, oh, you beat it on level one. Well, let's try level two. <laughs> and then we're going to beat it on level two and they're going to say, all right, well, let's try level three. <laughs> they just can keep arbitrarily raising the rules because they have power. They have a monopoly over the construction of the way it's set up. So yeah, it's unfortunate. And that's the first thing we need to fix. Yeah, so, we, only, so we can take our government back. If, if only they had, uh, you know, rioted the capital over something that was worth a damn not just keeping cheeto man in office right i i think and i just <laughs> i saw this as a lot of libertarians were defending these rioters right and this is kind of where i draw the line is because i say first of all i'm a i am a pacifist just as a person i understand that standard might not apply to everybody even when i'm being aggressive against i believe it's a tactic we can maybe talk about that on a later episode but even if you are okay with the violence and i totally understand sometimes you need you you know what i mean you got to use some defensive violence and the people doing the aggression are in the capitol building right i i understand that but yeah if it's because my guy got elected and your guy didn't it's abhorrent yeah, you lost yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, and, and you always. I I wish that the the, the hyper partisanships would put each other put put themselves in each other's shoes because you would not want that if you're a Republican and a Democrat was doing the same thing. You would not want the roles to be reversed. So why are you doing this? You don't want to make this a thing. Like right. why don't set this precedent? It was it was it was hideous. I I couldn't. I mean, I watched it on CNN just so I could hear the worst narrative possible, and I did. I mean, it was it was abhorrent and uh, disgusting. But I mean, do I, I? I don't directly blame Trump for that. That's that's where the difference is. I think I don't directly blame Trump for that. I blame society right now and and the divide that we've created with each other. And it's just uh, like, um, even if you tell, like, even if you know something is 100%, like, someone on the internet today was like, oh, in Indiana, you can carry a handgun, um, open carry, without a license, without a permit. And they, they said, you only need a permit for concealed carry. And that's true in the case of long guns, but with a handgun, you have to have a permit either way. You have to have a a, a, a permit in Indiana to carry a handgun. Um, so, I mean, that's just the way it is. It's a fact. But even being told that, it was like they they were so defensive, and they they 
made a technicality where well it, not if it's in your car in a box like but yeah that's not but that's not what you said <laughs> you know like it's just like people are so afraid to just admit that they made a mistake or that they were misinformed or wrong and 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 it's dangerous because there's so many ideas out there and so much so much different thought that you can consume and think about and and discover and uh challenge yourself and challenge other people with um, to lock yourself into one mentality and one idea and defend it even to to the point where you're, you know, lying to yourself <laughs> is, right. is, is very common nowadays, especially on the Internet. I see it all the time. And even with things that don't matter, that aren't even political, it's it's bleeding into other other things and then and then you see people in real life treat each other like that every once in a while now you see like wow that looked like a facebook argument like they were just being way too rude to each other you know like yeah but because i feel like that's not it wasn't a normal 10 years ago to do that in public but now because of facebook and social media that it's just like bleeding over into other areas of our lives. I don't know how I got off on that ramble. Sorry. That's okay. I don't even know where I started, but <laughs> we're, that's, we're how, used that's to, how I feel about it. <laughs> we're used to putting people in like the worst possible box. You yeah. know what I mean? Like as soon as you say, well, maybe Donald Trump shouldn't have been impeached. You're a simp. You're an alt writer. You're, you know what I mean? You're whatever. And then as soon as you say he should have, you know, you're some bleeding hearts. I, yeah. oh, what, what I got? Soylent, I think is what I got called or whatever. <laughs> oh, wow. Like, you know, like, like just, just, you know, and, and we're so eager to put these people in these boxes, mm -hmm. you know, like not every right winger is QAnon. <laughs> not every left winger is, you know, a Portland rioter. Like you just, <laughs> there, there's plenty of, you know, BLM people that didn't destroy buildings and plenty of Antifa people that don't, you know, break into people's houses. And there's plenty of MAGA hat people that aren't burning crosses and yards. Like you just, I think we're, we're used to putting people in their worst, but, um, do you, guys, do you guys think do you guys think that individualism is like a, a lost idea like a i don't see anyone pretty much ever referring even in the media or anything nobody it's always everybody everything's referred to in a group sense a they and it's always a they and a versus another they and where you need to self-identify which part you're in and um, or, or even multiple versions, it can be three or four, but there, there's no individuals. It's never a person did this or a person did that. It's, it's an oh. alt-rightist did this. So that way it's, it has a label, you know, like it was the mass shooting done by a right winger or a left winger. That's the first thing everyone wants to know. Like, so who can we blame, you know, like who can we hate about it and, and who will, who like, do you guys notice that? Or do you think that individualism's like dead? Because I feel like people don't think that way anymore. I feel like that's by design because indiv indiv like treating people as individuals doesn't serve the duopoly's purposes. They want us to hate each other. They, they want us to fight each other. They want to put us in groups because that's what serves their purpose. Um, so on what Hody was saying, there's a quote that I'm sure it's from somebody else, but my dad has said it to me a bunch of times, is that we, we judge ourselves by our intentions and we judge others by their actions. Hmm. And I, I think that that is a lot of what happens, not just individually, but as a party, as a nation, like we, we look at black lives matter riots or protests whatever you want to call it and we judge the we judge the entirety of it based on a few actions not the intention that the entirety of the group was trying to get across and it negates it, it basically negates what they were trying to accomplish based on a few people's poor actions and poor choices yeah. I mean, you, you don't have to address an idea when you're able to pin it, pin the entire ideology on a reprehensible individual, you know, and it does not help. I think part of the problem that we, the reason we have the problem that Chris has identified here, the reason we have that problem is because sometimes we do catch ourselves being defensive about it. How many times do you see libertarians like try to stand up for like Stefan Molyneux or like Richard Spencer, or, I mean, the, 
Chris Cantwell. I mean, these are people that are like literally like Nazis are cool and <laughs> like literally like, you know, white people are smarter than black people. Oh, I'm just I'm just asking questions. I'm not racist. I'm just saying, you know, and you're like, dude, like that is so anti-individualist. Like I can't like get off of this train. You know what I mean? I think one of the best things that happened to the Libertarian Party was what when like Cantwell went on um it was like Fox or something. It was like the Libertarian Party was too mean to me. And we're like, I'm like, good, you know, like <laughs> you're not a person that deserves, you know. And so, like, I think the thing is, is we get defensive. You looked at um, you look, I think. So let's let me use a right wing and a left wing example. You look at what happened with like BLM and the silence was deafening when they would destroy someone's store or like beat somebody up. And it's like, okay, like, he, and here's the thing, what BLM should have done would be, was, you know, people should have done more of them. I, and this is, again, I'm, I'm not, I'm falling to the same problem where I try to collectivize everybody. Mm -hmm. What more individuals should have done was condemn those people. Oftentimes they got defensive and they'd say, well, with that stupid line, hurt people, hurt people. Okay. So uh, we just don't convict rapists ever again because they got hurt when they were younger. Like, shut up. That is not an excuse to do evil to somebody or to destroy someone's livelihood. Like you should have been much more cavalier and say like, hey, and you don't even need to do it all the time, but just say like, hey, I'm going to say this once. If you hurt somebody or destroy their, their business, livelihood, whatever, you are not part of this. You know, I'm not even asking you to do it every day because I mean, the anti-media is going to find something every day, you know, that you could do, you know, to, to say, you know, the, the, I'm going to dismiss you because I found one thing, one thing, you know, it's not like you have to constantly be on like the defense of like feminism just because like some feminist said men should be raised and harvested for sperm. You know, you can condemn that whole philosophy once and then every time it comes up, at least people know where you stand. But, you know, and, and then the same goes for the right, right right wing when they weren't saying that they weren't when they found out that they weren't Antifa protesters in disguise during the Capitol riots. They were so defensive about what they did to just, you know, try and say, hey, like, okay, look, like maybe they weren't, maybe they didn't do the perfect thing, but, you know, they were doing something. And it's like, dude, just throw that, like, cut, cut them off. Mm. What does Christ say? Like, when you're, when the hand is bad, it's better to cut off the hand than let the whole of it rot, you know? Like, yes, like that, if that is any semblance, you don't need that hand anymore. Like, if those people destroying businesses or raiding Capitol buildings or, if that is part, like, cut that off. If you feel like you've had to be defensive of them, I think let it go. Well, the problem with that is if the right wing were to completely condemn all of the awful, hateful, violent racists, then nobody else would be there to vote for them. <laughs> well. I mean, there's a lot of group identity in that statement, but I'm <laughs> not going to touch it. <laughs> um, I, I like that. I like that you said that, though, Hody. Um, that that it's a, a defensiveness, and I think that uh, it stems a lot from. I mean, you people feel like they have to be defensive now because they they have to automatically react defensive because look at the look at look at the. I mean. Let's take a step back and look at the amount of attacks that Donald Trump took as president. Like, like he took a lot of attacks, some justified, sure, but more than anyone else has ever taken. He he took a beating from a from people, from the media, from his own party, from the other party. He took a beating, and that is, and then so did his supporters. They got called names by the person that was running against them. They weren't like, so then you're like, well, if the other person wins, I'm not even going to be accepted in this country. I'm a degenerate, you know, like, so like you, you just automatically, like, I can see how they would, people on the right under un, that fall under that would become defensive and become automatically react to, I need to f defend myself because it's going to come. The heat's going to come and all my friends and family are going to tell me I'm crazy and I have to defend my ways. So that's just like, I can see that that's like where it comes from. That's that's um, that, that we're describing the problem we're, we're talking about. That's where I see it coming from. What do you guys think? I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying, but then at the same time, I can understand why, why someone that like on the left would look at Trump saying, you know, grab him by the genitals 
and then not understand at all why people on the right, women on the right, would still be willing to vote for that person. So that is kind of deplorable that you would hear someone say something about about your specific demographic. I mean, are you? Uh, I was waiting for you to finish. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll let you interject. I, I don't. But. I mean, there there are many reasons to vote for someone, and and that that's not enough for me to. to when you get when you get two choices for president, that is not enough to to change your opinion of someone. War is war is way is the number one issue for me. If you are anti-war, you're going to earn my vote period, no matter what party you're in, there are other things that can take that vote away, but that is very important to me. So the sure. other things I am never going to get my, uh, uh, my ideology elected. My ideology is not popular enough. They will, I will never have 51% vote for my candidate, my Justin Amash, my perfect candidate, right? My Ron Paul, my, yeah. my perfect candidate, it's never going to happen. So I, I am always voting. I am always either going to vote for principles like I normally do, or for someone that's going to, in some cases, like in local races where I only get two choices and it's a Republican or a Democrat, I'm going to vote for the one that it has the best on my, on my top issues. And they might, they might, I mean, they might be for Medicare for all, but might be my only choice for Congress, right? And maybe it, like Tulsi Gabbard, she's great. She's anti-war, but she's for Medicare for all. So like, she's obviously not my candidate, but I'm going to vote for her over the other choice because it doesn't matter if Tulsi Gabbard says something important that like, well, she's not going to do that because she's a great person. She's just not going to say anything that would ever be like that. But like, it's not, it's a non-political issue. And, and it's not going to, it's not going to, it shouldn't pull you away from voting on your principles on, on, ish, on advancing the country. You know what I mean? Like if, if, if he says something that that's, that's that bad, you elect him and then you impeach him and then you get the vice president as the president. Like that's how it should happen. Wow. So what you're saying is <laughs> that if I think that if I personally feel that the conservative candidate is more likely to to vote in ways that I see as like good for me and good for the country that I should ignore their their history like admitted out loud history of sexual harassment like that doesn't make any fucking sense I, I, don't think, I don't think what he said was sexual harassment. <laughs> Let I, me I ask him. Grab him by the pussy. Yes, in a locker room with a bunch of dudes was not sexual harassment. They said he did. It was. It was. Like, it was. Let, let when you're let rich, you, you can do what you want. Whatever. You can okay. kiss him. You can grab him by the pussy. That's what I do. I grab him by the pussy. <sighs> All right. <laughs> Let's let, now hold on, Aaron, because I do have a question for you here. Then, then, how many black people do you think should have voted for Joe Biden based on his record, the record of Kamala Harris, and the things that he has said about black people? Then, I have not one time defended anything that Biden said or Kamala said. I think they're both just as bad. <laughs> My apologies for the mispronunciation. I know some people do that to like be racist, but I did that on it. It's it's Kamala. I I was. Yeah. No, I I think that Kamala is awful and she she's lied to get herself in the position that she's in and she's done terrible things and no self-respecting like I, I think I feel like if you if you care about those issues, those social issues that affect black people, you should never have given your vote to her because she's the one responsible for perpetuating those things, putting those black people in jail for small amounts of weed. Like, sure. that's like, like, that's that's like, but that's like policy. What we're talking about with Trump, like what Chris is saying, there's like locker room talk, you know what I mean? Which is just no, like no. dirty. Even if it, even if we just take what Joe Biden has said and not taken what he's done, you would still say like, that's bad enough that you shouldn't have voted for, for Biden. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if I, if it were me and I were black and I've got black kids and the the candidate that I'm considering voting for, I find out that he said that I wouldn't want my kids in that jungle. Yeah. That, no. no. I don't know why you have to be black to feel that way. I feel that way already. Well, that was the example. Oh, 
He asked me if, if I were a person of color. That was the yeah. example. Well, that's I, that's just what I'm saying. I don't have to feel that. I feel that way already. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have voted for him for that reason anyway. I agree, and I I think the end of Trump's running should have been when he was up there mocking a physically disabled person. That should have been the end of that. But. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's it's. I mean, some would call it respectability politics. Some would just call it being a good. Person. Look at who he was running against. He she was also right. breaking the law and saying just as abhorrent yeah. things. So right. that's what I, that's what I was saying was you have to look past that stuff and vote on the issues when you have two only two people that are that that bad but that's also why gary johnson got more votes than he never did because five million people did vote because they voted against both of them because of probably because of their values and because right. they were they were not likable people <laughs> and 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 i mean and that 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 really showed it came cool. through in the numbers for gary well let's uh let's uh let's go to the the last segment we got here guys it's called the uh, peace of my mind when i give you a piece of my mind i will start i wanted to talk about rush limbaugh for a second uh he passed away this last week uh died of lung cancer um terrible disease feel bad for him in regards to the death but here's the thing about rush limbaugh i uh if you love rush limbaugh i totally understand why you love rush limbaugh like there's, he was funny. Uh, he would, he was always quick with a good, obviously not all of his humor was <laughs> appropriate or good, but you know, when he was funny, he was funny. He was at, le at least attempt to make it humorous. You know, I think uh, Chris Spangle talked about this a little bit and that like Ben Shapiro is good at making people angry at the other side. Rush Limbaugh wanted to make you laugh at the other side. He, he, he existed to mock the left, you know, I was raised, I think for me, I did not, I wasn't raised hearing Rush Limbaugh, right? But I discovered him on my way to work, you know, and, and would listen to him to my lunch breaks. When it's high noon, it's Rush Limbaugh, you know, is what we had in Colorado. And so, you know, we, we, I'd listened to him and it was like, oh my gosh, it was the first time for me that I'd realized that there was widespread lying in politicians. Now, some people that are raised libertarians, that's not the norm. You are raised believing kind of your politicians like hey if it's on the internet it's probably true i know that there are lies on the internet but i'm sure they're rare or they're whatever rush limbaugh was the first person to open my eyes that was like no not only is there lying it's rampant and it's in your face and there's not even an attempt to reckon reconcile it you know and so for me i think that that, that was my gratitude to rush limbaugh i later would come to realize what a filthy human being he was um, the terrible things he said about people. And I realized that me saying like, well, I just remember the good things. It's kind of telling my friends that remember the bad things that they don't matter. Right? Like if, if you were a, if you're a person who died of AIDS and he played disco music and like was celebrating around while reading your name because you died of AIDS, I'm not exactly, my friends aren't going to hear like, I remember the good things about Rush Limbaugh and think that what I'm telling them is that they matter, <laughs> right? Or that like, hey, like that evil is so bad, it kind of undoes all that good thing about all the good stuff about telling me like, hey, this is what government does. So I think when you praise or criticize Rush Limbaugh, I think you have to be very specific because I just think if you say like, man, what a great human being, look, he did some great things as a human being. He was a, from, you know, he was a great neighbor. He had a studio that was actually like diversified. He made a point to like include, he engaged in dialogue. There are certain things you can point to that make Russia a good human being. That does not negate the bad things that he did or his net weight to those you know and and just and the bad doesn't outweigh the good either you when we talk about people i mean i'm glad we've already talked about individualism a little bit you can't boil them all down to one thing i'm sure that any of us have posted something on social media where we're like ah eh, that didn't age well i shouldn't have said that you know or like you know we we change we evolve as people rush did not change quite enough um <laughs> as far as evolving as a person but you know i think at one point that you look back and you say like hey look rush thanks for the good memories screw you for the bad memories. And it really made it hard for people to feel welcome in this country and feel welcome as a, as a human being. You know, if I know that you've kind of celebrated my father's death because my father died of AIDS, then none of the, none of the good stuff really matters. Like that is just so egregious. Had, had Rush maybe had some contrition later in life, 
you know, about saying like, hey, I know I did all these things. They were bad as opposed to just like, hey, I'm going to pretend the AIDS thing didn't happen anymore. Things might have been different. Um, I think I probably would have been much more forgiving and much more understanding. I uh, I think every one of us have pro has probably had some belief that we grow up and realize is like not just bad, but reprehensible. He didn't really have that realization. Um, I He was a great broadcaster. <laughs> he was talented. I understand the contributions he made towards uh, news media. But I think if you see somebody who's celebrating Rush Limbaugh, I would ask them to be specific. And I think if you see somebody that is spitting on his grave, I would ask them to be specific. And I would understand. I think... I think somebody can harbor these strong feelings because Rush was not somebody who left. He did not leave you a lot of room, wiggle room to love, to, to be lukewarm on him. Half the time you listen to him, you're like, this is funny. This is the best thing ever. Half time you listen to him, you're like, this is sick. This is depraved. This is the reason we can't have discussions like normal people anymore. I, don't know, I just had a lot of mixed feelings with it because I think when he passed, I had progressed so much past Rush Limbaugh, but I still like, I think when somebody dies, you naturally remember if there are any good times, you try to think of those. And so for me, I, I naturally was like, dang, that's kind of what made me realize that politicians were skeevy liars was Rush Limbaugh. And then I realized he was a skeevy liar. And, you know, I, I grew from there and I way grew past, you know, Rush Limbaugh. But I guess for me, I feel I recognize where where he got me. I'm grateful for that. I am very disappointed and uh, I shouldn't even say disappointed. It's outrageous. The things that he said, I have people that I love as human beings that he made fun of, that he despised, that he made this country inhospitable for, that he poisoned people's minds against them. And I understand if you can't forgive him, I'm not sure if I can forgive him either for those things, but thank goodness God's in charge of all of that. Um, Chris thoughts on Rush Limbaugh. I can empathize with that a lot with your position about the way you feel about him. Um, I had a similar experience with Glenn Beck um, early, early, um, like in back before the Tea Party movement. I kind of, uh, he opened my eyes to a lot of the things wrong with a lot of systems and, and a lot of government, the way government was set up and the way it was functioning. And, you know, I definitely grew way past Glenn Beck. Um, so um, I, can, I understand how you I, how you feel about him. I never felt that way about Rush Limbaugh. Um, how old are you, Hody? If you don't 30. <laughs> I, I am 36. Okay. I'm 30. I uh, never really had a radio age. Um, I don't know why. I never really listened to talk radio until I got older. Um, and then, you know, by then I already didn't. I was already past Glenn Beck, right? So I was obviously past Rush Limbaugh. But yes, I, I mean, so from what I know about him is only the things you read. <laughs> so it's only negative things. That's, I mean, pretty much all I've read about him. I understand he's basically a pioneer in, in talk radio and, and, and the, the media itself too, right? So, I mean, he obviously had a massive audience. You could say the same thing about someone like Alex Jones, though, and it doesn't make him... Uh, a, like a legend. So I think that he's on another level compared to that. Um, and so it wasn't just his audience that he impacted a lot of people in, in both positive and negative ways. And um, I think that that is the one thing that I took from, from his passing is that um, there aren't very many people without a very strong opinion about him. <laughs> um, he, it reminded me of Trump. Um, if, if, if Trump died tomorrow, uh, there is very few people that would not have a very strong opinion about whether they were happy or sad about it. So, um, uh, that's how I feel about it. Um, I'm kind of disconnected from it though. I know Aaron's a little bit more, uh, has a little bit stronger feelings than I do. <laughs> yeah, Aaron, Aaron, let's hear all the nice things you have to say. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I'm not sure if I can come up with any nice things. Okay, I would say probably the nicest thing I could say about him is I really, I honestly, truly hope for his soul's sake that the hate that he spouted was not actually how he felt and it was all over that $40 million they were paying him. Because I'm pretty sure I would say some crazy shit if you were giving me $40 million a year. Might be willing to say some crazy stuff that I might not necessarily believe. How very capitalist of you, Aaron. Yeah, I was about to say, <laughs> capitalist you? Jeez. So I, I clearly, 
a lot of the things he said were absolutely hateful, disgusting things. And uh, I can't say that I can think of too many nice things to say about the man other than good riddance. I'm glad I don't have to hear him speak anymore. Like uh, one of the people that I've done a lot of work for in their home is a Catholic family, very conservative. They've got 12 children and Rush Limbaugh was playing on the radio pretty regularly in their home. And I would have been less surprised if they let their Catholic children watch pornography throughout the day than to hear those innocent, sweet children being fed that hate. And that's all I got to say. That's fair. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Aaron, uh, give us a piece of your mind. All right. So the thing that I wanted to kind of touch on uh, was capitalism. And, and you know, Chris and I have had plenty of discussions on that. And specifically, I wanted to talk about Texas and, you know, the, the things that are going on down there. I'm a contractor and my dad and I were talking about, you know, taking a trip down there. We had talked about that. You got a whole lot of people down there that are hurting real bad. And a lot of it is because, you know, Texas chose to have their own their own power grid to to stave to stave the regulation and to to keep out of the foot of the Fed. And you've got a whole lot of companies that can't keep stuff going right now and you got people that are hurting real bad and they're begging for the socialism at this point. They're begging for the government aid. And I, I, I think that this just, it's a really good example that shows the greed that, that, that shows the bad side of capitalism. Yeah. Capitalism makes my life a whole lot easier. It makes my life a whole lot more comfortable, but there are bad parts. There are bad sides to that. And if you don't regulate things, these are the kind of things that can happen where you have a whole lot of people without power and a whole lot of people that can't feed their children because they chose to, to, to go with the free market. And now the free market is screwing them over. It's all about the profits. These companies are making record profits in, the, in this last week. They're making more money than they would have made all year. So they're not hurting. They clearly don't have to choose. They don't, they don't, they don't have to charge 180 times the normal rate for that power or they wouldn't be making record profits at this point. I think what they're doing is immoral and it should be illegal. I don't think that they should be allowed to do that. And across the most of the country agrees because that is the regulation. You can't you can't take advantage of those people when you know when they're down and out and you've got people that are getting twenty thousand dollar light bills and I just that, that's abhorrent it's ridiculous and the regulations were there the regulations they wanted them to follow were there to save them from this exact problem and had they followed federal guidelines federal regulations their stuff would have been would have been built up to snuff and they wouldn't have had this problem because plenty of power companies all across the globe deal with cold weather all the time they just weren't ready for it in texas because they didn't have to be they didn't have to be and now the people are paying for it not the company the people right would you say just as it as my my rebuttal to this would be: Do you believe that Texas energy is a free market system? That is their goal. They're they're much more closer to a free market system than IPL is. Okay, Indy Power and Lights. Yeah, because they are they do exist on a monopoly that is that is st it's not federally mandated, but it is mandated by the state, and it is still a monopoly. And I just, I think for me, that is my big issue is if you have, as soon as you don't have to compete for people's service, 
you get Texas. You know what I mean? And and that's why I am probably still a capitalist. Um because I, I see the elimination of this competition. I, I, I'm not saying you're wrong either in your observations because you're right. They are begging for to be on the rest of the country's grid as they cycle through. And, and the thing is, is even if as individualists, we are going to collectivize a little bit. We are going, not everybody is going to have their own thorium reactor in their home, right? So there are things that are going to be shared, but the way Texas do it was, it, was, it was, they did it about as anti-free market as possible. I mean, this is a, we have this issue a lot as libertarians when we talk about um, schools, right? They're all local. They're all, they got these local issues and local problems. It's not, there, there is a department of education that is super corrupt and evil, but there, you know, a lot of the abuses that happen happen on this local level. It's the, the I think the issue that I have is government in general. And I think a lot of people are blaming this on, you know, oh, look at this free market thing they did. And I kind of look at it and I'm like, they didn't even get close to a free market um, would be my response. Gosh, Hody, you made my job really easy on this one. Took the words right out of my mouth. I mean, our dream would be that there would have been five competing electric companies all vying for you, Aaron, to buy their services. Therefore, if one raised the price, you could just cancel your deal with them and go sign up for the competition. But unfortunately, we live in a world where government gives contracts and gives private uh, private chunks of market to, to companies so that they have no competition and they can operate freely without any, any outside influences. And uh, that's, I think that's the problem. That's the problem, the root of the problem. I, I, it's, uh, I think it's mistaken often to blame capitalism. I think it's a very often thing that I think it, it's a thing that happens very often that capitalism gets blamed for something like healthcare. Healthcare is so broken, capitalism can't handle it. And I'm like, but healthcare is like the most regulated industry there is. <laughs> like it's it's as far from capitalism as, as there is in America in a market. So um, that's how it is. That's how I see it with the power as well. Um, what do you think, Aaron? So a big problem with with the idea of there being five power companies or five water companies or five gas companies is it's nearly impossible to create the infrastructure for me to be able to switch using IPL and start using Duke because now they have to put 28 million lines just to run to my house. That's cost prohibitive and you can't, you don't actually end up with, any kind of competition because once once those power lines are in there they're in there and you're not going to be able to they're not going to be able to just go in and turn a valve yep. in the water line that says now you get your water from this company and not from that company and you can't have literally power lines going to every single person's house that go to every single different company's grid it, it, that's an impossibility you can't that and, doesn't work well, it's not impossible, but you're right. It doesn't happen today. And that, that, that I can understand where you would make this argument. But see, um, it's very easy to measure the negatives, like you said earlier. It's very easy to measure when bad things happen, like how many people were affected because capitalism. And, but it's also very hard to measure the good things that have happened because of said capitalism, because you just assume in your head that they would happen without it, right? Um, and and I was going somewhere with that. <laughs> what, 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 what was your what was your question to me, Aaron? Was it? Well, I'm not sure. I asked a question. What I said was that you can't really have a free market with five oh, different right. five different competitors right. to give you your power and 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 that's what i was saying by the bat you can't measure it's easier to measure the bad things so you in a, in a market where there's not been competition for decades it's it's lacked innovation like um if you think of probably the the 
organization that has the oldest computers um, is probably the government, right? Um, co companies upgrade their computers because they know they need the technology to further innovate and build new products and sell more services. But the government always lags behind. When there's no competition for a service, there's no innovation for that said market. So yes, yes, there is no way to connect five electric companies to your house currently. But I argue that if there was competition in this market for the last 30 years, there may very well possibly be a node in your, on your street that has multiple connections to it that your neighbors can then lobby uh, or buy, purchase and then the companies decide based off how many subscribers they have on that road if they bring service to that node. It is very, it is not impossible to see a future where innovation fixes those problems because profit, because they would profit more, they would have more customers in more areas because they could compete and they would and they would want your business. So they would make it affordable for you to, to be able to switch because they would want you to be a customer and pay them. I think, I think Aaron's point is well taken, though, because I do think it is something that capitalists, we tend to be dismissive of these concerns. And it's like, listen, these are the, these are going to be growing pains if we get like capitalism, <laughs> right? If we get the free market, right? Like you're saying, like, we, we have these great optimistic ideas. I think it's important not to paint it out as some kind of utopia. You know, it's like to say like, hey, listen, freedom is freedom. You also have the freedom to make bad decisions and hurt yourself with freedom. You know what I mean? Like oh, yeah. socialism sometimes saves people from making bad decisions and hurting themselves, you know, oh, and yeah. for better, or for worse. And I think that, and so I understand like these kind of growing pains um, that would happen. I, I obviously I'm going to side probably more with Chris on this one. However, I think Aaron is not wrong in his observations because I think it is something to say like, hey, listen, a lot of people say, I mean, how many times do you people have people say like, okay, well, let's just get it rid of the federal level. And if it's at the state level, it'll be so much better. Well, this is, this is kind of the comeuppance of that, right? Like this is, this is, this is in energy. We cut us up, they cut themselves off from, you know, the federal grid and now they're on their own grid. And this is the grid, you know, like did the state do it better than the federal government? Obviously in this situation, no, they didn't. The, the the government always fails, always fails. So the reason that I am for a more state level government over a federal government, because if government always fails and you only have one government, then everyone fails. If you have 50 governments, there's a chance, <laughs> although I'll be it slight, that some governments may succeed or create better solutions, at least compared to their competition, competing governments. Like uh, Texas may have fallen, but it is much better than the entire country have fallen right now, correct? So um, that's where I look at. There are negatives. There may be a loser, yes, but but there are there are many more winners uh, um, because of that way that it's set up, and and that competition even between states is kind of like the free market, and it, it breeds better government because Indiana wants to do better than its neighbors, right? So that's why that's how we get better government. There's no competition with the federal government besides them hating each other. So there's no there's no growth and innovation in the way governments ran because there's no there's no competition. That's why I like state government better. I think yeah. there's a there's 195 sovereign nations and they all every single one ended up adopting the Nazis economic model like every single one ended up doing it. And it's like I don't like unfortunately I want to believe that there'd be more competition if we just broke it down and made it all like local but I just I don't know man. I don't know. I I would invite the experiment obviously I would I would probably still prefer a lot of counties instead of one big massive sovereign government, especially with the stuff America is doing around the world, as you noted, Chris, you know, at least it would make it may, maybe at least it would disjoin our efforts to like blow up other countries. But as far as that solving all the problems, I like know. it. Cause then if one state is a bad actor, you have 49 checks on it. And, um, and, and it's a lot better than you have a one federal government bad actor. And the only other check is itself. Another have, branch of itself. We, we like, have 195 okay. checks on America right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Do any of them? Can any of them really check America right now, or do we run free and roam the land and police the world like we want because no one checks us? That <laughs> I want to decentralize our power so that way people can check us. Like you, the yeah. UK could check California, 
Like they could check Texas if Texas was acting bad, but they can't check the United States. Aaron, like, since this it's, is a piece it's of risky, at least. <laughs> sure. This is a piece of your mind. I'll let you get the final say on it, yeah. and then we'll turn it over to Chris's thing. All right. So I I can completely see where you're coming from on the is this a free market argument, but that doesn't change whether or not this was about deregulation. And and one of the things uh, clearly he hasn't said it today, but one of the things that Chris has said to me is regulations always hurt. They always hurt the people and they only help the corporations. And this was about deregulation and it absolutely hurt the people and it absolutely helped the corporations because they didn't have to pay the money to put in the equipment needed to keep the gas lines going under freezing temperatures like they would have had they been regulated by the federal government like all of the rest of the power companies in the country and right. no it's not a free market but neither is anything else at all period. that's true uh, all right okay well i'll give you a piece of my mind then it leads right into my piece of my mind because <laughs> there are free markets absolutely uh, but that's not my peace of mind so I really just I really just want to know both of you. I want to start with Hody. Hody, what's your favorite pizza? Cuz I've been dieting and I am craving pizza and I can't eat it. And I want to know what's your favorite pizza? We have a local place here called The Pie and it is stacked with cheese. Like monstrous wow. amounts of cheese like so much so that like sometimes they get complaints that people put too much cheese on the pizza and <laughs> i i am a cheese nut i am insane about cheese i i just i i could talk about it i could talk about every different kind of cheese <laughs> i um and so for me the pie oh it just it hits all the right vibes with me i mean the crust is still good i i i hate a sweet sauce um, I, I, for me, a tomato is sweet enough that as soon as you add sugar, you, you messed it up. So for me, the, uh, this, yeah, it's a nice, um, I like spicy sauce. I can handle some of that, but, uh, you know, they didn't, they don't sweeten their, their sauce up and I just love a nice mild pizza sauce. Um, yeah. And so for me, that's it. Now, as far as like nationally goes, cause I'm not sure that can help you at all. I think Papa John's is probably still doing the best nationally, although, the others are keeping up and I think that that's, that's good to have some competition, but yeah. Are you just asking me to like describe like what I have on it or like, are you looking for, Oh a, yeah, if you want to, I'd love to hear your favorite toppings too. Yeah. So like I am a pretty much a cheese purist. Although if you have a nice ground sausage, Oh my gosh, I really love ground sausage. Like under the cheese. cheese. Yeah. Under the cheese. You can put some on top of the cheese too. Under red pepper, red pepper flakes. Um, I mean, if if I'm if I'm in heaven and I'm making and I'm having angels make my pizza, <laughs> let's stuff the crust on that pizza too. Let's mm -hmm. find a way for me to get more cheese in there somehow. I love it when the uh, edge of the pizza is kind of like garlic bread, you know, like they've uh, they brushed it with butter and they put some garlic and herbs on there too, because then you're like, all right, it's different than a pizza, but still Italian, still tasting good. And that way, you look forward to your crust. Wow. Um, I'm a, I'm definitely, I, I am definitely a deep dish guy. So long as it's not deep with sauce, I think there is, I hate to be too negative on sauce again, but I think sometimes you put like, they're like, look at this deep dish pizza. And it's like a soup with like tomato sauce. And I'm like, that's not, come on now. Like if it's, are, are those shots at Giordano's? Uh, <laughs> it has a lot of cheese, but it has a lot of sauce too. Yeah. You know, I, I can tolerate it as long as you got the cheese to make up for it. But yeah, DiGiorno's is all right with me. Um, I am I am probably one of those that falls into the uh, sexes like pizza. When it's when it's good, it's great. And when it's bad, it's still pretty good. Um, I think for me, all pizza is still pretty good. So I, I, the judgments that I've made have been me being picky. But I would, I would probably eat even a poorly made pizza. I would still probably enjoy. Uh, how about you, Aaron? Uh, I would say locally, Mars Hill Monster. Chris knows what I'm talking about. That's a everything on top of everything kind of pizza. No mushrooms, no black olives. Oh, everything else is fine. Yep. And uh, like uh, nationally, I prefer Domino's. I like their uh, pan pizza. Kind of the opposite of what you said. Like, 
I don't like that much cheese. I can't do st stuffed crust. Like I prefer sauce over cheese all day, every day. I like like a nice airy, like fat bread. Hmm. <laughs> all right. Two opposing pizza choices. Chris, <laughs> Chris, where do you land? Um, I, I love pizza. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't even matter. I, <laughs> if you say I want pizza, you want pizza and they say what toppings I'm like, whatever you want, whatever you want to throw on there. I'll eat it. I, I, like you said, mushrooms and black olives, black olives are all right. Like whatever. I don't eat them, but mushrooms are great. But, um, I definitely will eat any. Well, there is one exception, one exception. Pineapples do not go on pizza. Pineapples yeah. do not go on pizza. I love pineapples, but I don't like warm pineapples on my tomato sauce with cheese. <laughs> like that's weird. So like that's the only exception. I'll eat any other kind of pizza, but not pineapples. Um, everything else is cool. Even uh, on Marshall Monster. Well, no, yeah, I don't really like it on there either, but I still eat it. Whatever. <laughs> um, so like I, I even think Aaron, didn't you even work at a pizza place once? I did. I worked at Domino's for a little yeah. while. Yeah. So did did you know that Domino's has like uh how do they do their cheese? Like they have big blocks of cheese and then they just put it in a machine and it shreds it all, right? No, it definitely comes pre-shredded in a bag. Huh. And there's like four bags in a box and you cut them open and pour the cheese into a bin and then you sprinkle it on the pizza. Oh. Interesting. All this cheese talk. I'm gonna have to go. I'm getting, <laughs> yeah, I'm I know you're getting antsy. <laughs> I, I mean, with, so like, um, I just wanted to really thank capitalism for how good pizza tastes, and that <laughs> easy to get straight to your door. Um, and because of the free market, there's so much competition, and that we can all like totally different pizzas, and it's all acceptable because you like pizza. You didn't even nobody said they didn't like pizza, and that would have been the wrong answer. The correct answer was whatever kind of pizza you like, but capitalism gives you that choice, and it's a beautiful thing, and we should not want to destroy that. Um, even think about like the innovations that have been made in pizza, like the pizza box itself and how if, if there's too much moisture in the box, it makes a soggy pizza by the time it gets to your house. But if it doesn't keep the pizza, like if it keeps it too warm and the steam like makes your pizza all soggy, you open it up, you're like, that's disgusting. You know, like, but if also in the same sense, like it has to keep it warm enough. You don't want a cold pizza. Like, and then you want it cut all the way. So they got to get those sharp cutters and then they're cutting hundreds of pizzas a day. So you got to like get sharp and like, there's so much innovation that you don't even think about that capitalism gets no credit for that you consume every week or every month, all of the time, pizza, even frozen pizza. Even frozen pizza is innovative. Think about the way they have to make the crush specially to make sure there's air in it. So that way when it's frozen and when it's made and then unfrozen on its way to a uh, grocery store and then frozen again and then unfrozen on the way to your house and then frozen again and then finally cooked and it still has to like look good and taste good. That took a lot of, of R&D and a lot of money. And, and they budgeted that in to still be able to sell you a tombstone pizza for three ninety nine, and you can get three for 10. Like, mm, isn't that a beautiful thing? <laughs> Aaron, I feel like this is, this is so that's barely, this is barely veiled criticism of your economic school of thought. So I'll let you respond first. <laughs> well, as long as as long as the slaves across the world aren't responsible for making sure that my pizza is only three ninety nine, then I'll agree with you that capitalism is fantastic. Woo! Oh, Chris, you won. <laughs> you won the podcast. We can hang it up. Now. Um, no, I'm I'm with you. You know, so I, I love I love economic literature. I think a lot of what I get from the definite because everybody defines capitalism and socialism differently. I feel like whenever you talk about it, you have to ask. Hey, first of all, what do you mean when you say capitalism and socialism, even before you get into the conversation? It's just for me, like, I don't think the conversation can progress when you're just talking in those generalities because people don't have the same definitions. I think for me, I deal with a lot of like origin stories. I've read at like I love Adam Smith, you know, um, and, and I read a lot of the history. One of the things that I was reading was it. And this is uh, 
a, a tidbit you might not know about, but it's a fun one. The USSR actually made more food than America did, um, even at the height of the starvation, the Cold Wars. It's just they didn't have um, they didn't have the incentive to give it out, and so a lot of it rotted in the mills. And that's why uh, people died as it went stale and stagnant. And the thing is, is um, I think that it is, I do think when you read something like The Conquest of Bread, I do think there's a compelling point to be made to say, hey, that's cute. Like you're rubbing our luxuries in your face. But if you have like homeless people dying, that kind of negates anything that I care about. Like the fact that you got like, ooh, look at this little topping I got on my pizza when there's somebody like starving to death in the streets. That being said, I probably am with you, Chris, and that I don't see a way of I don't see a way of structuring your economy in a way that incentivizes people to actually give out the food that like not only is it not good, like as you mentioned, Chris, what they were giving out was bread, right? Is bread lines. I mean, this is you know, they're, it's not great food that you were getting, but and I would be okay with that if they were meeting their quota of feeding every single person in the in their country you know because i'd be like hey you know what as much as i like cheese i understand that if is ev keeping everybody alive and making sure their needs are met is more important however the problem that you get with some of those i mean you look at what they were eating in venezuela and the fact that they ran out of food is embarrassing because it was basically it it's not called a potato it's called like a yuca or something um but essentially they they were feeding their people potatoes and then they ran out of the incentive to keep feeding people potatoes and now people are trying to catch cats and eat that way. And so I think the issue that I do, that I see, I, I see Chris making this inference and I think he's correct, um, that it, it is hard for me to imagine what a structured economy looks like that actually meets everybody's needs and then keeps meeting their needs and has the incentive to do so. You know, And I think for me, not only does capitalism now, capitalism does, at least if we call the current, let's just call the current situation capitalism, if you will. You know, it is embarrassing to me that we live in a nation that we have people that starve to death when we throw out away so much food. Um, and I do see that as like luxurious. Do I get with the socialists? Like, do they have a point when they say like, hey, look, you might have a million different kinds of pizza and you had 80 different people starve to death in your country last month what is going on over there? I'm like, yeah, that's, that's tough to answer for, you know, like that is something you got to answer for. However, I don't see a way of kind of covering that problem with a state run system. I'm not an advocate for a state run system. I'm not a socialist. I'm not a communist. My goal here is merely to point out that there are shortcomings to capitalism. That's it. Okay. <laughs> That's it. I'm not saying I'm I'm that capitalism is the. You're not pro anything. You're not you're not bringing any solutions to the table. <laughs> I'm sure he's I got said? something. Is that what I said? Do I didn't say I, I didn't say I was anti-capitalist. Oh. Oh. Okay. No, that's just what you take from what I say, not what I actually say. I'm not an anti-capitalist. My goal is to point out that there are shortcomings, there are bad parts, and there are things that we could address. It's not the it's not the golden the golden pedestal that we, you know, this is the best that humanity can ever freaking do. I'm not I'm saying it's not that. It's it's, yeah, it's not I never said that. It's that it's the best we've ever done, but it is not the best we could ever do. Right. Otherwise, we'd be on the USS that's Enterprise why, right now. I advocate for an entirely different system of government, like, or at least a very limited, very different from what we have today. Right. A very much more limited system than we have today. Um, it wouldn't even be recognizable, like, <laughs> compared to what we have today, because people would. I mean people may not even go vote because it has such little impact on your life. That's what I would want. Interesting. I but think uh, give all the power to the corporations that are already <laughs> trying to fuck us over. Okay. That's their so, goal. <laughs> That's their job is to get as much money so out of us as they can. So you're a statist. 
Did I say that? I, I'm trying to identify your view then. If you're saying I, limited government means more power to the corporations, then what do you want? You're just being anti everything and offering nothing positive in return. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to get you to say what you are, not say what you are not. <laughs> uh, I, it's hard for me to put myself in a box. Like I, I hardly even call myself a libertarian because clearly there are bad sides to all of the situations i'm just i'm just here to point out that that there are bad sides to capitalism and it's not the the greatest thing that's ever happened to the entire world because there are a lot of people that still suffer and well, in 1970, the uh, poverty, the the people living on less than a dollar a day was 27 percent in the world, and today it's six, so or even lower, maybe four. So right. I, I don't, and there are, I don't and think there are Aaron, more slaves today than there ever have been in history. Wage that, slaves. You know what? Uh, no slaves. You know, actual, actual slaves. Actual slaves. There are more slaves today is that than true? there ever have been. Hmm. For real, I gotta look. I, gotta, I tell you what, I would have to look that up. Uh, by the way, uh, I did look up what I uh, the Clinton scandal. The Clinton scandal was Whitewater. By the way, I, I had the wrong water in my head. Watergate, Whitewater. They all sound the same. Um, guys, we are gonna have a lot of debates about this. Oh yeah, so, <laughs> so this is fun and it's productive. I wanted to talk about pizza a little bit and lighten it up. So because we were talking about some serious issues for a while. So sure. Well, and then and I mean, you turned it around, then made it about economy which is good i think uh i think it's it's good to have a discussion about i i think uh certainly we will be talking about economics a lot because i think uh, i think probably all of us are like going to be against the drug war and certain things like that um so obviously when we talk about debate and we talk about our differences but this is hopefully the first of many conversations everybody thank you so much for tuning in um hody johns aaron v chris galt we love you all to death and uh Thanks, please please uh tell everybody you love the show share it around if we get a lot of engagement then you'll hear show number two from us and if not then the market will provide you with nothing so yes. <laughs> <laughs> we are not we're not corporate we're hanging on by a thread here guys anyhow thank you so much and we will see you all next time have a good night